I'm Matt Knight. Hi, I'm Matt Knight. I'm very fortunate to be the head of ecology and sustainability here at Shipping to Bay. We Support of the One Carbon World Grant. We have verified, reduced, and offset our carbon footprint. We are also a participant of the United Nations Carbon Neutral Now Initiative. We have set emission reduction targets in line with climate science. Hello, my name is Hoyt Swagger. I work for Working and World Council in the Energy Team. We grow produce for our local food banks and 24 raised beds, a huber culture and an aquaponic biodome. Hey, fishy, fishy. We use land farms to compost our food waste. We're also working with our community to reduce our travel footprint. Our footprint is reducing and we love doing our bit to help fight climate change. Oh, we want to inspire other people to start their journey into sustainability. Thank you for watching! You might have seen videos like this before, but here's the big secret. Anyone can make one of these videos in a few minutes. You might think... is Dinton Pastures Country Park in Wokingham and they've just built a brand new activity centre which is one of the South's first net zero carbon buildings. Here they're doing their bit to save the planet. The perfect location then to find out what Generation Z think of UN efforts to tackle the climate emergency. Be completely honest then, how much do you think about climate change on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, to be honest, I don't think about it every single day when I wake up, but I'm definitely mindful of it. And I try to, you know, cycle to places rather than being driven. So I try and reduce my global footprint and my family's as well. We think about it quite a lot because it's at the forefront of our lives and we've heard so much about it all the time. There's no planet B, so we need to do something now. What kind of things do you do on a daily basis? Me and my sister decided to become vegetarian which um, helps reduce the amount of meat intake, so the amount of methane being produced into the atmosphere by cows. I also try to reduce my dairy intake. Me and my family try not to bulk buy when buying foods, and also if we do have leftover food from meals, we try to preserve them to eat them in the following meals in the following days. Well, I used to buy a lot from fast fashion brands, um, and now I try to buy less, and when I do, buying from sustainable brands, because looking into it is such an eye-opener, like the devastating impact fast fashion has not only on the environment but also like on local communities that are employed there. We're not just constantly buying new things that we don't actually need. We think about um, what impact is this having, having on my carbon footprint. Greta Thunberg, she's a young lady like yourselves. She's been very critical about politicians and the global efforts that are being made. What do you think about that? Um, well, although there is a huge responsibility on politicians to provide good examples for the public and legislation that will encourage us to make changes. I do think that there's also a lot of responsibility within large companies that are knowingly destroying our planet and also on individuals to make behavioural changes that will ensure that we have a better future. There are things that people aren't doing because it's not convenient and I think we need to start doing that. 
for example, I have family who lives in different parts of the UK and all the recycling schemes are so complicated in different areas. COP26, we've heard so much about it this week. Do we think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to stop an environmental catastrophe? This won't be a quick fix. It's not gonna be this meeting and then that's the end of it. Um, but I think this could be a really good step towards making plans and sticking to them, stopping catastrophe from happening. We can't just stop here. We have to keep that momentum going, keep taking these opportunities and taking little steps in our everyday life to start reducing the effects of climate change. So can I get a show of hands? How many of you think that we've reached a point of no return? And for those of you that didn't put your hands up, does that mean that you're more optimistic? I'd like to say so. I, I think um, we've still got a bit of time left and I feel like even if we do like um, start now, we could always make a big impact if we collectively work together. Yeah, I agree with what's been said. I think we need to act now so there is still time, but there's always hope to do something about it. So we should never give up hope. Hope, that's a good place to end this. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hello everyone and welcome to this, our second youth climate conference. My name is Gregor Murray. I am the elected member responsible for climate emergency here at Wokingham Borough Council. It is an absolute pleasure and honour to be speaking to you uh, today. We've got a really action-packed agenda for the next couple of hours and I want to get to that really quickly. But before I do, um, I just wanted to say, look, we, we've just seen some absolutely fantastic videos. One from Shinfield St Mary's Primary School, which actually featured at COP26 during the two week event that all of the world's leaders were at talking about climate change and what needs to be done, which is a fantastic accolade for the schools within our community. We also saw a video there about Denton Pastures, um, which is the first carbon neutral building that we woke in Borough Council have built in our community. That video was shown on Meridian TV as part of their COP26 footage. And Dinton Pastures Activity Centre actually featured at COP26 as well, which is another fantastic accolade for our community and showing how we're we're leading on, on climate change within our within our borough. The aim of this conference is to continue the conversation with you about our local climate change, about the issues that we face, and to help give you the tools to help you reduce your carbon footprint, the carbon footprint of your household, the carbon footprint of your school. We're looking at local issues and solutions to climate change that are happening right here, right now on our doorstep. And we've got some fantastic experts to speak to you today about some of the things that we're doing as a community and some of the things that you could be doing as individuals, as families um, and within your school as well. The agenda for today is, is pretty action packed, it's pretty tight. So we're gonna have to stick to some timings, but hopefully there'll be plenty of opportunity for you to ask questions along the way. You can do that using the chat function uh, that we have here. I will collect the, the questions and I'll make sure that as many of them as possible get, up, get asked to our experts and to the panel that we have speaking to you today. Firstly, on the agenda, we're going to speak to a, a panel of representatives from the council. So we have Duncan Fisher from our ecology team. He's going to be talking about the tree planting initiatives that we have, the biodiversity initiatives that we have and the rewilding issue initiatives that we have. Um, then we'll be speaking to uh, Georgina. Um, Georgina is part of our energy team. Energy team are really leading part of our community's response to how we generate more clean energy, how we take control of our energy future. Um, and then we have Donal as well, who's going to talk to us about active transport, about how we can get ourselves moving around our community um, and the different ways that we can be uh, that we can be doing our journeys across our community. 
Following that, we're going to hear from Lizzie King and Ruth Strange. Lizzie and uh, Ruth are going to talk about um, Teach the Future and also about the ethical consumer and the impact of what we buy and how what it has on our planet. And following that, we're going to hear from Charlene Duncan, who's going to be talking about the Southeast, uh, sorry, excuse me, Southeast River Trust. Um, and giving a presentation on the local impacts of, of climate change on our waterways and what they are doing locally for us as a community in order to approve our waterways. We're going to get into that in just a second, but first of all, I want to hand over to an absolutely fantastic individual. Her name is uh, Annika Dixit. She is the uh, Youth Climate Champion on Wokey and Borough's Youth Council, um, and she's gonna be talking about what our schools can do and what you can do um, in order to, to lead on climate change. So over to you, Annika. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Anika, and I'm the Climate Change Champion member within the Student um, the Wokingham Youth Council. Um, after watching David Atten Attenborough's Our Planet, I realised the drastic consequences that climate change could potentially have on our planet's future. And I was horrified by the fact that within the next few decades, climate change will lead to an ice-free Arctic, 40% of the world's population losing their homes due to flooding, and most shockingly, the start of the sixth mass extinction on Earth since prehistoric times. Um, these consequences have actually motivated me over the past few years to work towards becoming more eco-friendly within my day-to-day -day life. Um, some of the things that I have personally done, including include um, reducing my meat intake, um, buying less products when I don't actually need them, as I mentioned on the um, uh, the ITV interview, um, and also persuading my parents to invest in an electric car, which not only uh, reduces our carbon footprint, but um, also reduces our travel costs. Um, at school, uh, I, I go to Bohunt School, Wokingham. Um, I have promoted being kinder to our environment through um, a zero electronics Earth Day. So we, we're trying to hold that every year where we don't use our iPads and um, computers and lights and reducing our electricity usage um, and then I've also um, had the um, started the climate action project which is like a worldwide project um, between students and um, teachers from worldwide connecting them together so that they can understand more about climate change um, with the role of climate change champion I intend to expand my work further and I want to campaign for um, reducing climate change in and around the Wokingham area, so within schools, but also within our community. Um, and this is why I've, within the Youth Council, I've introduced um, a subcommittee for climate change um, where I would like to work with other young people and um, other individuals who are motivated like me um, to achieve goals such as climate change um, spotlight events, including fundraising for environmental charities and planting trees in the local area, um, green workshops in schools, but also within the community, um, eco day challenges and community cleanups. So uh, litter picking, but as a social event within um, our area. Um, similar to the things that we've been trying to do at our school. Um, I want as many of you who are interested to join our climate change subcommittee so that everyone can make a positive difference and reverse the course of climate change um, before it's too late. Um, so if you're interested in doing any of these things or if you have any other further suggestions or ideas, um, please do sign up to this climate change subcommittee, which I will be leading um, on the digital sign up form, which I'll email to you after the meeting. Um, if you have any further questions, please feel free to drop me an email. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anika. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I had the absolute pleasure of speaking to the Youth, Com uh, youth Council a couple of months ago. Um, some absolutely wonderful thoughts and feedback from the group um, when I spoke to them. I've already had a couple of great ideas come through from that group as well, which is brilliant. Um, and I want, I want more of them. I want to hear your voice. I want to understand what it is that you want us to do. Um, I'm absolutely committed to supporting you any way I possibly can. And I hope everybody listening into this today 
we'll we'll buy in, we'll join your subcommittee as well, and then let's really start making a, a huge difference. So thank you very much, Anika. Uh, now I will ask Duncan, Georgina and Donald to uh, to join me now. Um, and we're going to have uh, a, a conversation about what the council is doing and what you can do um, in order to support that. Now, in the council, we talk about two different areas of focus for us. So we talk about the actions that we as a community can take, um, and we talk about the actions that individuals can take as well. Now, before we get on to that, I'm just going to give everybody a very quick chance to, to introduce themselves, to give us a very quick summary in terms of what it is that they, they do in the council um, and then we'll go into some questions so if we start with Duncan because he appeared on my screen first good afternoon everybody uh, my name is Duncan Fisher and I work as the ecology officer um, I suppose there's a bit of a interchange between the word ecology and biodiversity principally I advise on um, habitat management to um, maximize the benefit for biodiversity and take consideration of protected species and important habitats and species that we find in the borough. Uh, thank you, Duncan. And I will move on to Georgina. Um, hi, so I'm Georgina Wisby and I am an energy officer in the energy team. Um, and we deal with basically anything energy. So um, from billing um, all the way kind of to renewable projects, uh, energy efficiency, metering, anything energy uh, we kind of deal with. Wonderful. And Donal. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Donal McFarlane. I am active travel officer for the My Journey uh, team within Wokingham Borough Council. So um, what we do is we try to promote active and sustainable travel as an alternative to taking the car or taking something else, which is like highly pollutant as a way of transport. And uh, we promote it to schools, uh, the community in general, and to workplaces. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Now, Georgina, I'm going to start with you, if that's OK. Um, so we talk about actions that we as a community can take. And I think some of the things that uh, the energy team have been doing recently have made a few headlines, and I'm sure everybody will be wanting to hear a little bit more about them. So, yeah, as a community, we know one of the biggest things that we, we're going to talk about and be able to do in the next couple of uh, years is take control of our energy generation and our energy distribution. So how are the energy team impacting on that? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, you might be talking about the Bolmush uh, solar PV project, which uh, you've got your photo in there. Um, so yeah, so across um, all of our schools and corporate sites, we are uh, trying to make um, them as energy efficiency, energy efficient as possible, as well as uh, making sure that they can generate their own electricity via solar PV. Um, so currently working through all of our school sites, we're doing uh, many kind of efficiency projects such as LED lighting replacements, cavity wall insulation, loft insulation, um, single glazing to double glazing projects, but we're also uh, running a lot of solar PV um, on schools. So currently, historically, we have actually got quite a lot of solar PV on corporate sites already, um, but we're actually kind of growing our, um, I guess, portfolio of solar PV sites. Um, so yeah, over the last, even over the last kind of few weeks, we're still getting, putting them up um, all across, all across the borough, um, which is really positive because it means that not only that the school can be as energy efficient as possible, they can also create their energy and actually use that instead of taking from the grid. That's great. I mean, it's not it's not just the schools that we're looking at, though, is it? Because uh, I think a lot of people hopefully will have read that we're going to be building our own solar farm as well. Can you tell us a little bit about the solar farm? Yes. So, um, yes, we have a, a quite a large solar farm going up and it has gone through planning um, and I will get so I don't get it wrong the figures um so it's a 29 megawatt peak um solar farm um and I think it's due to start in April 22 building it um and it's meant to take two years to build um by the time that it is built in essence all of the corporate buildings uh will be considered net zero um as all of the electricity will be coming from that will hopefully from the solar farm, um, which is really exciting. Um, there are some more in the pipeline um, and hopefully uh, with planning and budget and everything, we'll get more kind of solar farms in the future as well. 
Thank you. I mean, that's absolutely great. Just uh, to give give everybody a little bit of context, the, the solar farm in, in Barkin that is going to be built should power somewhere between five and 7,000 homes in our community, which is roughly about 10% of the households. Now, um, you know, Georgina talked about using it to, to make our council carbon neutral, and that's one of the, the key things, one of the most important things that we're going to need to do. But just to give you the context, it is it's somewhere between five and 7,000 households. Um, now, Duncan, turning to you, if that's OK, um, I guess I, as well across ecology, there's probably one of the most visible things that people associate with climate change and with the green agenda. So how are we as a council working in ecology to help reduce our carbon footprint? Uh, that's a great question. I'm just going to, uh, if I may, if you'll indulge me, quickly pick up the soda farm a bit more. Um, because uh, one of the things that's also been uh, secured within that solar farm array is an improvement to the um, biodiversity of the grassland there um, that's underneath all the solar panels. And actually that biodiversity uh, benefit is going to help uh, um, capture carbon within the so soil. So we're going to see some carbon sequestration going on on the land that the solar farm is on at the same time. Uh, so as long as we manage that land well, uh, we can uh, we can uh, uh, use it for two benefits. Um, and uh, it, the, uh, the, the main other thing that uh, is within our emergency action plan is uh, a tree planting target. And um, trees are, are great at uh, uh, capturing carbon. Uh, Mother Nature invented the first solar panel uh, and used it to uh, capture carbon, which is brilliant. And uh, and so what we've uh, got is a, a, a target of 250,000 trees within the next five years. I predict that uh, what we're going to see there is um, is a, a, a ramping up of tree planting over the five year period because we're going to need to uh, assess our own land holdings and what's possible to to achieve within our own land holdings and where we can work with with partners. Um, to uh to to achieve that uh planting target and if we uh concentrate on um create going from uh in, in impoverished carbon poor habitat to a carbon rich habitat like woodland where we're seeing uh, carbon uh, captured both within the trees and within the soil if you look at a, a, a good woodland there's as much carbon in that soil as there is above ground. So it's some, something that really blows my mind to try and get my head around that. But um, uh, uh, then what we're going to see is, a, is a, a really good progression of carbon sequestration that's going to last for many years into the future. Um, so uh, that's what we're going to try and do on our own land holdings. That and other forms of new management to help sequester carbon uh, is all going to help uh, contribute to uh, becoming net zero. And how does that also help us increase biodiversity across the community? Well, there's a, a, a generalisation I'm going to make, which is um, the more biodiverse the habitat that we're creating, the better it will be at capturing carbon. And part of that is uh, more biodiverse habitats are uh, show a certain degree of resilience and ability to um, uh, continue to function even when they're uh, 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 tested against extreme events, even uh, uh, when they're um, uh, in uh, long periods of dry spells or in intense rainfall events and things like that. So um, by us addressing and thinking about it in terms of biodiversity, we then also get our carbon sequestration benefits. And the other way around, if we start thinking about how we create good carbon sequestration habitat, then we will start to understand and build. Uh, a, 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 and, and if we work towards that on a larger scale, we start to build a greater resilience across a larger area in terms of um, biodiversity um, uh, uh, gain and, uh, and, and long term uh, uh, ability to deal with um, uh, a, a climate change uh, in climate changed environment. Thank you. Now, I'm just going to stay with you just for a second, Duncan, because we've had a question and it is particularly relevant. Um, so I thought I would just bring it in right now. So we are asked 
are any green walls going to be planted? Now, I, I'm a big fan of green walls, um, as you know. Um, so what, what are the plans in terms of green walls and what are your thoughts on them? Um, I have to say that uh, our, our principal focus at the moment is on uh, getting the tree planting project underway and understanding the tree, uh, the, uh, writing a tree strategy to inform tree planting and how we manage our ongoing mature trees. Um, Green walls certainly not out the question. Uh, I agree with you. They're an amazing uh, uh, innovation, really, to help um, bring greenery and bring, um, uh, in some ways, shade and and, and water uh, he, uh, into a, what is a could be a dry, very dry and hot environment in the future. Um, and so, uh, I don't think there's uh, uh, ruling out of green walls being planted, but I don't think they're yet within the um, the scope of the tree planting project. And so we will have to work out how we uh, understand the equivalents and, and, and work to support those because because they are a, a, a good way of, of, again, sequestering carbon, but also adapting to carbon uh, climate change. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with you, Duncan, and I think green walls in particular are a great opportunity for schools, many of which have a lot of sort of blank wall space that could be used and adapted to to green walls. Um, they've also got rooftops that can be used to harvest water to then feed the green wall um, going forward as well. Um, and, you know, I think if you go to, um, if you go, anybody goes to Twyford and look up at the, the lampposts, we've got quite a few uh, living lampposts in Twyford now, which are absolutely fantastic. They've just been uh, bolted onto the side of the lamppost there. They provide greenery and, and flowers and a bit of brightness and colour. They're self-watering, solar powered, um, and they also not only help us reduce our carbon footprint slightly, but they also help improve air quality. Um, as well in in that area, so absolutely fantastic. Uh, now, Dona, I'll move on to to you because about a third of our carbon footprint as a borough comes from people travelling around our borough. So, people going to work, going to school, going to the shops, going to the station. What are we doing in order to reduce that quite sizable chunk of carbon footprint? So. Um, as a as a borough, we're going about it in a like a number of different ways. Like first, to talk about the sort of the the the, the heavy option, the sort of the the large um, my, my words are disappearing from me. But uh, changes to the transport routes. So uh, we have a greenway project. Which is going, which is aiming to link all of the developments together, all the new developments which are being built in the borough, with shared use pathways. Um, you, I don't know if uh, if a lot of you have been to the Finchhamstead Baptist Centre and along within California Country Park, but um, as our current greenway runs through there, it's a it's a completely off road path. It's um, it's been specially the the material of the path has been specially manufactured that um, water will run off it so that it will never get um, you'll never get big puddles on it so that people can use it all year round. And um, I think there's quite a number of students currently travel to bow hunt at the moment. Um, coming through that greenway um, aiming to do more the most recent um, route that we have done is on the A329 or the the London Road running up from um, Montague Park into the uh, almost up into the town centre of Wokingham. Um, most of that um, is now shared use with a little bit that's that's on the road, but that's now that people can um, can travel safely on their bikes or on their scooters or walking all the way from that, which is actually our Wokingham Borough borders with, with, um, oh, why have I forgotten right, the name? Bracknell. Bracknell, Bracknell sorry. Uh, borders with Bracknell, that runs all the way to Wokingham Town Centre. Wokingham Town Centre is still, there's still links to be developed there, but then from Wokingham Town Centre, you can travel along the, 
the Reading Road all the way to the border with Reading. And that's via um, that is like a, some of it is shared use and other is a, like a cycleway that has been marked on the road. So if from those two points, you can actually travel all the way all across the borough from one side to the other on um, on a fairly safe transport routes. Other than the we're so again, this is something which is we're continuing to do work on. Um, and at the moment we are looking, we're doing LC whip work, which is looking at walkways and cycleways to see how they could be improved. The main routes that are used around the borough. So that's kind of the hard manufacturing stuff. As a our team, my journey team, we specifically are working a lot more on what we call the soft approaches. Um, one of which, which is cycle training. So um, I would think most of the students who are listening at the moment probably went through bike ability in their primary school, and that would have been delivered uh, by uh, cycle trainers who we hired to do that within the school. So uh, the ambition is that like all students or almost all students by the time they get into secondary school have the ability to cycle safely or to try and if they've got level two to cycle on quiet roads. Uh, we also go younger than that. We do a bi-weekly lessons during turn time teaching kids how to cycle so that they have that option that they're able to go. Um, and then I suppose the last thing I'll mention is um, this summer, I'm not sure if many people were aware of, we did Beat the Street from the 8th of June to the 20th of July. I say if you were aware of, I'm guessing you probably were because it was massively popular. There was over 6,000 different people took part in Beat the Street. And it was a it was a scheme where little beat little boxes were put all around uh, Wokingham, the area around Wokingham, and people were given cards. And when they matched it up against a, a a box and then against another box. They got points for the amount that they walked. And over that, over the um, from the 8th of June to the 20th of July, over 150,000 miles was either walked or cycled or scooted. So it was, a, I think, a, a very impressive um, thing from the people of Wokingham to go out and to um, to transport themselves in a green way. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, Beat the Street was an absolutely fantastic event. And I say that for, for a number of reasons, not least of which because my daughter's primary school won um, and got the most the most votes. And I think um, one in one Saturday, I felt sorry for my poor dog because I went out and tapped 22 different boxes, just me and the dog, um, just in order to, to get some, some extra points in. But absolutely fantastic program and well done to everybody that was involved in that and everybody that participated in that. Now we've talked a little bit about what we as a community are doing um, and what those community actions are but the single most important thing that we can do the thing that's going to have the single biggest impact on climate emergency in Woking Borough is for all of us to live more sustainable behaviours and live more sustainable lives and that's a choice that we've each got to make. Uh, now by participating in events like this and coming onto this climate conference, it shows that each one of you is keen and eager to do your bit. And that's absolutely fantastic. And so what I would like to do now is talk to each one of the members of our panel and ask for your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions of things that people can do in their own homes, in their schools and across our borough in order to live those, those more sustainable um, behaviours. Now, um, Duncan, I'm going to start with, with you. Um, what, from an ecological perspective, do you think the, the listeners to this conference can do in order to, to live more sustainable behaviours? Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to just say um, I really enjoyed the presentations that you uh, mentioned were on at the start of the, uh, of the conference. And um, I find them inspiring because we get ideas from, from uh, the attendees to these panels the, and uh, the children across the borough. And uh, we really want to hear your ideas about what we can do uh, to Im Im improve our tree planting uh, uh, and uh, improve our management of, of green spaces uh, and uh, what kind of wildlife you, you really value and want to see in, in these green spaces. 
Um, so uh, there are consultations ongoing. We have um, uh, uh, a, a preliminary uh, consultation on the uh, uh, tree uh, planting project uh, that ends tomorrow. So uh, one more day uh, to give us your views won't be the last opportunity for you to tell us what to do. And we certainly have uh, created an email address as well that uh, we welcome you to um, uh, submit your ideas. Uh, if uh, you are uh, already doing all of that and telling us what you want to see, um, the main thing I, I encourage you to do is find um, uh, enjoyment or tell me what you want to see in your green spaces in terms of biodiversity, wildlife on your doorstep. Well, if you travel uh, across the county to go to a special place for wildlife benefit, then tell me why you do go, go there and how can we create something uh, equivalent that you don't have to travel so far? What, how can we create something on your doorstep that actually um, uh, lowers your carbon footprint by going and enjoying it uh, locally? Uh, that's um, a, a key thing I think we want to uh, hear from you. And um, then have a think about what could you do on your school or in your gardens? Um, could you leave a little area for uh, wildlife? Could you be a bit a bit more messy? Uh, probably not being asked to be messy all the time, but it, actually wildlife benefits from a bit of mess. It benefits from leaves being left in a compost heap if you must, but um, in a pile somewhere in your garden. It benefits from uh, having uh, some long grass, that sort of thing. So if you can spot an area where you can uh, just let wildlife um, have a bit of space over winter, et cetera, then you'll be doing a great benefit in terms of boosting biodiversity and therefore building this more resilient ecosystem that's going to help sequester carbon. Wonderful. Thanks for that, Duncan. Um, something that I saw quite recently was also no mow May, where people are encouraged not to mow their lawn in the month of May, um, which I really like the sound of as somebody that is responsible yeah. for mowing the lawn at my house. <laughs> yeah, I quite I, like I the have, sound of, of doing that. I have similar arguments over my garden. It's no mow May and then knee high in July. So uh, you can keep it going. You don't have to mow uh, come uh, June, July. You can keep it going. Uh, and there's some uh, brilliant wildflowers in my lawn at the moment that I'm hoping to leave to overwinter because um, the um, the flowers actually close up and they create um, great little uh, overwintering habitat for invertebrates. Uh, so the sort of uh, little insects and spiders that uh, need somewhere to uh, overwinter as uh, as adults. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Now, before I move on to Donal, um, I just want to remind everybody that you have the chat function available to you. We're going to ask some questions um, from from the audience very shortly. So please, um, please get your, your questions written in, put them into the chat function um, and we'll make sure that they get asked to the panel very, very shortly. Um, now, Donal, over to you. What suggestions, recommendations would you make to all of the people listening in in terms of what they could do to reduce their carbon footprint through the way they travel around? Um, thank you, Gregor. Um, so as I, as you mentioned earlier, um, transport is like it's a major cause of the pollution and carbon that is put into our atmosphere. And in a sense, my answer to everyone is going to sound really simple, but it's, I, I suppose, to, to put it in the best way, like uh, we're not suggesting that um, if you are traveling to Liverpool or to London, that you jump on your bike and you pack a tent in there and you go and spend four days getting to Liverpool, but you have traveled green and sustainably that's not going to be an option for you. What we're talking about in trying to do more cycling, more walking, it's the little journeys. It's the can you transport yourself to school by bike? Are there safe routes that you can go? If so, can you do it maybe at least once a week if you've never done it before? Um, I often present in businesses to try and get them to to take up more uh, sustainable transport. And that's that's what I generally say to them. Try once a week, 
try once a month and see how you feel about it. There's a lot of evidence actually that um, actively transporting yourself into work, be it walking or cycling, you have increased levels of concentration, you take in um, information better, you work better, you study better if you're more active than if you're sitting in a car. Maybe though you can't transport yourself to school. Can you, if you were visiting your grandparents or if you were going to the shops or if you're going to the cinema, if for each of these little journeys, can you transport yourself actively? Is there an option for that? Can you do that at least some of the time? And for every time that you do that, you're reducing the pollution which is going out in the atmosphere. You're doing a benefit. And like another thing I want to say is um, you'll see, and I suppose everyone would see on the roads, there'll be some people who cycle and they have the most expensive bike, like a couple of thousand pound bike. They have a pointed helmet. They're covered in lycra. They're big, muscly going out. And that is a part of cycling, but that's not all of cycling. Like I, uh, a lot of people who like to promote cycling like to reference Holland because they have a really lovely cycle culture there. But if you look at Dutch people cycling, they're wearing jeans, they're wearing jumpers. Most of them aren't even wearing helmets, which isn't something we would recommend. But that's again because it's much safer there. But their approach to cycling is how we approach walking is like, oh, well, I want to cycle. I'll just jump on the bike. You don't need clothes, special clothes to cycle. You can just cycle. And I'm just going to jump in with one final thing I'll say is that like for those who can't actively transport themselves, we have there's a competition we're running for secondary school students about making a short five minute movie or short five minute thing on their phone to promote active or sustainable transport. Uh, we that was originally to finish at the start of November. We've extended it now until the 7th of January. So for anyone who's listening, who uh, who is good with a phone, who has a message they want to put out there, who wants to talk about the benefits of being active, uh, I would urge you to uh, get your phone out and put something together. Thank you for that, Donald. That sounds absolutely fantastic, and I hope that all of the people that are listening in today will um, will get on board with that and then start making videos. I really look forward to to seeing them myself. Um, one thing that I I speak to a lot of businesses as well, and one thing that I um, always say to them is one of the easiest ways to cut your carbon footprint from transport is to look at the number of miles you do in a week. Um, so you know, record the record the mileage on your car on a Sunday night, and then record it the following Sunday night. See how many miles you've done and then try and cut it, cut it by 10 percent, try and cut it by 25 percent, try and cut it by 50 percent. You can make those little changes. They very, very quickly add up over the course of the year. In fact, um, we had some we had some data that showed us that during the first lockdown period, um, the the mileage done across Woking Borough and the carbon produced from it reduced by 62 percent just as a result of people not being able to drive around. Now, unfortunately, that was the result of a, of a massive impact crisis on us as a, as a nation and as a world as a whole. But it does show that those changes do make a difference and do add up very, very quickly. Um, now, Georgina, I'm going to come to, to you now because the only thing that generates more carbon for us as a community than transport is energy. Um, now, I'm not blaming you completely for it, but you are one of the, the group that is tasked with what is a very, very big challenge is to reduce the amount of carbon that we produce as a community from the energy that we use. So with the audience that we've got at the moment, what hints, tips, suggestions would you give them to help them reduce the amount of energy they consume themselves um, and as a, as a family and as a school? Yes, so there's um, a lot of behavioural changes which can be done in both schools and then also the home. Um, it is um, a lot of kind of making sure that we um, understand the best ways to kind of reduce that carbon or reduce the amount of energy being used. Um, and it is tricky in schools at the moment because as much as we can say close the windows um, when it's and, and don't let heat out at the moment, ventilation because of COVID um, is causing quite a large issue. Um, 
with energy usage. Um, but in obviously an ideal world when COVID wasn't wasn't around, um, the the message would kind of be if it's if it's winter, have you got the heating on? But is the window wide open? So all of that heat is going out the window. Could you actually close the window, keep the heat in? Um, during the summer, is the are you t uh, putting on jumpers when it's cold? Um, and making sure that you actually use um kind of things around you to reduce reduce your energy um usage um and that can kind of translate into your home as well um is there a way at home that you can switch the lights off um instead of as everyone says um making black hole illuminations um around your home um and then also uh closing the windows uh, making sure the heating's not on full whack windows wide open um and then also in terms of um potentially not you guys because it's the youth, but um, there are schemes that Woken Borough Council are also doing where you can get uh, funding for energy efficiency measures at home, um, and that is kind of um, to support uh, Woken and residents as well. Um, but yeah, also if there is, in terms of the schools and in terms of um, reducing it, if there are any measures that you think that we should be doing, so if you're walking around your school and saying, actually, why do we have a wooden single glazed window why don't we have double glazing get in contact with your teachers say actually we think this is a project that could be undertaken um if you're looking at one if you want to have solar pv and understand more of what's going on or if you see solar pv on your roof and you want to understand how much it's producing or um what does that mean in terms of the carbon that's being saved from being put into the atmosphere um then get them to talk to us because we do have we do have quite a lot of figures in terms of what the solar PV is doing. Um, but yeah, in essence, if you see anything which um, you kind of want to point out in terms of there's not LED lighting everywhere, um, if you want to make sure that, that the windows are single glazed or if you think actually does the school have cavity wall insulation, not that you might be able to know, um, then yeah, we, we want you to get in touch with us um, so that we can go out because without kind of knowing what is out there, we can't really change anything, so yeah. Thank you for that, Georgina, that's a really good point. We want to hear your ideas. We want to hear what you've got to say to us and the different things that you think that we could be doing. Every one of the officers that's on this call right now, um, everybody wants to know what you think we should be doing because, you know, I always say that the only bad idea is one that you keep in your head because I can't do anything with it. Um, if you put forward an idea, if we've already got it, we'll tell you that we've already got it and we'll tell you what it is that we're doing about it. If we don't have it, we want to know so that we can we can progress it so we can take it forward and I think what you can see with the officers that we've got just on this panel everybody is hugely passionate to take forward the ideas and the suggestions that you've got so please share them either through the youth council or directly with us because we we do want to hear now um we've got some time to to get some questions in before we move on to the next agenda item um so if anybody wants to to ask please feel free to go into the chat to put in your questions now um, and we will I will try my best to make sure they get answered um, we've got one which I think probably falls to me to to answer but Duncan you might um, have some some thoughts on this Georgina you as well which is when it comes to investing in the solar farm and tree planting how are we going to get this money um, now that is that's probably my biggest concern um, and my my biggest task as um, as the leader for climate emergency within our communities is how do we pay for these things now the great thing about a solar farm is that um it, it while it costs us a lot of money up front to build the one in barkham is going to cost about 22 million pounds um it will actually pay for itself in the long run so it generates electricity that we can either sell back to the national grid or use ourselves as a council to reduce our energy bills um, and that way we can actually pay down you know, we will borrow money to pay for the solar farm um, and we will then use the revenue that it generates through the sale of electricity to pay down the debt on it and also to hopefully generate an excess every year that we can then use for some of the other initiatives that we want to use within climate emergency and we have committed as a council that any profit we make from having things like solar farms, we will then reinvest into other initiatives that will bring down our carbon footprint in other areas. In terms of tree planting, we've been hugely fortunate. Um, and I'll let Duncan talk about this in a little bit of, of detail because he's been a lot closer to it than I have. Um, but 
We have gained a huge amount of support from an organisation called the Woodland Trust. They have provided us with what is literally called seed capital, which I love, um, to help our tree planting initiative. So I'll hand over to Duncan and let him talk about that in, in a little bit more detail. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Gregor. And uh, the uh, the Woodland Trust really, uh, we we applied to uh, this uh, seed capital uh, grant, uh, grant fund uh, pot um, to be able to uh, uh, ha help with our uh, tree planting uh, program, um, and uh, and they were very impressed with uh, a a the scale that we were attempting as a local authority. Uh, uh, that's um, uh, not the, not the biggest local authority in the country, but we were certainly uh, aiming high. And um, and B they were keen on the um, uh, garden forest initiative that we uh, are hoping to promote, which is encouraging us to have. Uh, bring more trees but into the uh, suburban environment uh, which will actually help benefit I think in the long run um, uh, our adaptation to, to uh, climate change as well as uh, helping to sequester carbon so uh, really a good opportunity to if you've got room for a tree in your in your garden and you'd like one uh, there will be an opportunity to say uh, coming up soon uh, watch that engage platform because we may be able to uh, help you uh, plant a tree in, in your own garden. Um, but the the funding from the Woodland Trust is helping with those that purchase of the trees. Uh, the other thing that we had to do when we, um, and excuse me if this is going to get really dull, do interrupt Gregor if, uh, if he's getting a bit technical, but we uh, when we uh, assessed the project, we had to um, look at other potential income streams. And um, there's a, a recent, um, uh, act that's just passed, uh, uh, so uh, the uh, Parliament passed the uh, Environment Act, and that's going to mandate something called biodiversity net gain uh, in for future developments. And we anticipate there being uh, a requirement for biodiversity net gain uh, to be demonstrated within um, Woking and Borough that could, and that and the funding for that uh, biodiversity net gain could well be used to create these more biodiverse, uh, richer uh, woodland environments when we target them in uh, in locations that are good for carbon sequestration, good for biodiversity. We can use some of that biodiversity funding to uh, help um, create this dual benefit. Thank you for that, Duncan. Uh, now, we've got a couple of other questions. Again, I think they're probably more likely to fall to me to answer than uh, the members of the, the panel. Um, what plans does the council have to make recycling and collection of waste much easier, convenient and genuinely eco-friendly? Plastic bins and bags, charges for household waste disposal all cause and encourage widespread damage to our environment. Um, so we are currently consulting on a new waste strategy. Um, the link has been posted in the group chat by um, Debbie Morgan. And again, this is something that we want your thoughts and your ideas on. Um, we currently collect week, uh, waste on a weekly basis. Um, we do that because there's a lot of soiled waste within our within our waste stream, uh, as it's called. Um, we've removed things like food waste from, uh, from that. So we now recycle food waste. But 26% of the contents of the blue bags across Woking and Borough is still food waste. It's still food that could otherwise be put into recycling boxes. And yeah, if there's one thing that you could do right now at your home is make sure that all of the food that is wasted in your home gets put into the food waste bins and then take action to try and reduce the amount of food you waste in your own homes. Um, the, so we're we're consulting on um, we're consulting on the waste strategy right now. The link has been put there. Please feel free to to add your thoughts, your comments, your ideas, and your suggestions of things that you would like to see from the future of waste across our community. You're going to inherit this community at some point in the future. Make sure it's ready for the world that you want to to live in. Um, what can we do in order to help? Uh, so how sorry how can we do things on a larger scale? to help, recommendations to support, fundraising, charities, etc. So um, maybe I'll ask um, Donal and Georgina if you've got any ideas on how we can do things on a larger scale. 
That is a good question. Um, in terms of energy, I guess it's um, in terms of, I guess, corporate and schools. Um, if you, I, I guess it's using your voice. And I think that's always what is um, on a large scale. I'm not, not 100% sure on how to do it in terms of uh, on charities, etc. Um, but yeah, in terms of using your voice and I guess coming to platforms like this where you can you can say what you um ask the questions make sure that you get your point across um and then if there is anything that you can do um and if we can develop on that then that would be great as well donald do you want to add anything to yeah in, in terms of in terms of larger scale um i i know for instance that like sustrans they look after the national cycle network which is the network of uh, what's like cycle routes which is spread across the united kingdom which um like they as a charity um are looking for like monumentary or money help as well as like actual like physical help to clearing the route making sure that it's still marked and safe um and i suppose there is um there are larger, much more well-known charities as well, who are like such as Extinction Rebellion or such as Greenpeace are looking into like green transport options. I suppose, again, I suppose if I was saying myself, like if you were looking to do more like yourself, bigger elements, you could start looking at like actually jumping on a plane is like is one of the the biggest contribution things you will do on a single thing are there other options that you can do instead that's quite a big one though to consider because that is quite a big change to your life but it is the planet which is changing so it's things to consider along those lines Sorry, couldn't get myself off mute there. Um, I'm going to answer one more question and then um, we'll we'll move on. So we've had a question which is, uh, are the council planning to do anything about the overflowing bin situation on the communal green spaces of the borough and will they be adding more recycling bins? This is a really interesting question um, and is one that I have raised with the, the council's waste officers. There's yeah, the, the, there's nobody from the waste team on this um, on this panel today. And so you know, the next time we do this, I think we'll definitely make sure that there is somebody from the waste um, team on it so they can talk about the waste strategy and they can talk about some of the, the questions that are here. Um, the ideal situation actually in communal spaces is for people to take their waste home with them. Um, that's what we would much rather people do. Take it home, put it into your own bins, recycle it appropriately, food waste, cardboard, plastic, etc., and then general waste into your general uh, waste bags. That is the absolute ideal situation. And going forward, I am asking that we do more communications to uh, get people to do that more often, much rather that than adding additional uh, recycling bins across our community when actually a small behaviour change, which is the single most important thing we can do to combat climate change, a small behaviour change would actually have a much better result for us as a community. So at the moment, do we have any plans to add more recycling bins? No, we don't. As part of the waste strategy, we may decide to add some more recycling bins across our community. But actually, what I'd much rather is that people take their waste home with them. Now, at this point, I'm going to say thank you to Georgina, to Duncan and to Donal for their time, for their energy and enthusiasm and for answering uh, my questions and, and some of your questions. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, I hope what everybody has taken from this is that we have a really committed officer team right here. They really want to hear your thoughts, really want to hear your ideas. And when they've got great ideas, they really take them forward, really execute them well and are really making a huge difference to us as a community. So thank you to our, all of those guys for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, and now we're going to go over to Izzy King and to Ruth Strange. Uh, now, Izzy King is a youth volunteer at Teach the Future, uh, and Ruth Strange is a writer and researcher at the Ethical Consumer magazine, and they're going to discuss the topic of conscious consumption. So I think, Izzy, I'm handing over to you first, 
Um, and don't forget, everybody, if you've got any questions, please type them into the chat box. I will appear in about 25 minutes time and I will put some of your questions to Izzy and to Ruth. Thank you. Hi, um, yes, my name is Izzy. I'm from Teach the Future. We are a, um, a small, kind of small UK um, climate organisation working to get climate education into the UK um, education system. So first, I'd like, so after that introduction, Ruth, would you like to say a little bit about um, the ethical consumer? Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Just, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm Ruth from, I'm one of the researchers at Ethical Consumer. It's a magazine it, based in Manchester. We also have a really brilliant website, loads of resources, articles. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, we've been going since 1989, so we've got a long um, history of experience looking at conscious consumption. That sounds really cool. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what makes a consumer ethical versus non-ethical? Okay, yeah, so I think the the main thing is really that you're thinking about the impact of the things that you buy and the things that you use. So the things that you consume, you're thinking about, you know, what went into making them, who who made them under what conditions, um, what are the materials, how are they produced, all the consequences basically of what you're using. So it's almost like looking at when you spend money, it's almost like you're investing in different ways of doing things. So you're either or voting. So you're, you're either voting or investing in, you know, things that you would really, really how you'd like things to be done. Or if you, yeah, you, you'd rather do that than invest in, you know, damaging, damaging production. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And what makes what kind of ethics? Well, we look at we have um, we have a complicated methodology for how we research all the different companies. So we we make product guides. So we have over a hundred guides to different things that you might be buying, like or spending money on, um, from bananas. So lots of different food and drink things, um, clothing, electronic goods, but also bank accounts. Um, and yeah, there's there's a whole and energy, you know, your utilities. So anything that you might be spending money on. And then for each company that we look at, about 20 in each sector, we we rate them on a whole range of issues, ethical issues, uh, things under um, the category of environment, so to do with climate change or palm oil um, or pollution and toxics, things under the category of people, so workers' rights and humans right, human rights, how they manage their supply chain, um, things to do with animals, so animal rights and animal welfare, and things to do with politics so like are the companies paying their fair share of tax or how how much are they paying their directors compared to you know the people in the supply chain um yeah and we're not saying that the choices that you make as a consumer are enough to change the world and make it into the kind of world we like they're not they're not going to be enough we need changes to the whole way things are done um systems of how we produce things but those choices that you can make as an individual are very significant and they'll they'll lead you to discover other things and they'll be part of a journey that could lead you to changing bigger things as well. Wow, so it sounds like it spans quite a lot of different things, um, consuming ethically, a lot of things to do with people, a lot of things to do with the environment. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, what do you think it is that young people consume which has the biggest impact on their climate on the climate and their carbon footprint? Okay, so this is really well-timed question. So, I mean, obviously this year we've had the COP26, the United Nations conference in Glasgow just, just now. Um, so everyone's talking about climate. So to coincide with that, and obviously it's just been building over the years as the problem gets worse and it becomes more and more of an emergency and you've got less time to deal with it. So we've been trying to focus more on climate change, although we look at all those things and we think they're all important. At the moment, we're trying to focus a bit more on climate change and um, make that much more visible because it really needs action urgently. Um, and so we've just done a report called the Climate Gap Report, which is about where do we need to be and where are we now and what will it take to get to where we need to be to cut emissions enough? Um, and in the magazine that's coming up, 
going to be due out in mid-December and, and will also be on our website. Um, we've got a follow-up article to that report. So the report was looking at, yeah, what can... We, do, we, we really need governments and companies to make big changes and, you know, they've got a lot more power than we do as individuals, although we have power collectively. But we, um, we were looking specifically in that report, trying to draw out what it is that consumers can do um and the follow-up article is trying to say trying to look at what well, it does look at yeah which of the things that are going to have the most impact because there's lots and lots of things we can do but it's really helpful to know which are going to be you know the most impactful and i think i heard someone just before saying flights so that is the top the, the best thing you can do is reduce the amount of long-haul flights if that's if you are taking them anyway just reducing them that is the number one thing but that's not something we do every day so in terms of everyday choices food what you eat and transport how you get around are really really important they, they have a big impact so reducing the amount of meat and dairy or any animal produce having more plant-based foods really really does make a big impact and it's not just the emissions that are produced by animals it's also the land use that happens to make space for animals to graze so taking away a forest especially in south america at the moment um yeah so food is really important and also transport so finding alternatives to not only flying but also conventional car use so for some people that would be different depending on your situation but for some people it will be if they really need a car if they're reliant on a car some people you know, for example, if you're disabled, it can be pretty difficult without a car. So ideally moving from conventional car use to electric car use, but that doesn't apply to everybody. Lots of us can do without a car and use public transport more or even cycling and walking. And that makes a big difference as well. There are other things that are big for consumers like um, switching a gas boiler to a heat pump, but that's a, a big investment it's more for householders and it's not really something you can do every day but every day thinking about your food and your transport is really important it can have a big impact yeah those are some really fantastic points i think um i definitely 100 percent agree with i agree with all of them but i think the transport one really hits home because um that is something that can be quite difficult as a young person you can't we can't always drive yet um and we rely on other people to take us places. Um, so that's where things like buses and buses come in really, really handy. And it's it's really important for us to make use of those in the best way that we can. Um, I know some people might sh even struggle just with buses, um, aside from, for example, a physical disability, getting onto the bus if the buses in your area aren't accessible. Sometimes it can be quite anxiety provoking, but I think although to take it at your own pace it's something um that could be done to work on and sometimes it can reducing your impact on the climate and your carbon footprint can be a little bit of a motivator to work on things like that um another thing i also thought of was um just buying things that we enjoy it's absolutely it's it's a really good thing to buy things that we enjoy but it's also really important to make sure that we're not just replacing things that we already have it can be a really good motivator to get a bit creative for example if you're looking at clothes online um, and you're thinking oh I really like those they look really they look really nice or it could be a new game it could literally be anything whatever you're interested in um, it's always a good idea to maybe pause and think wait do I actually need this what else do I have in my drawers what do I have in my house and get a little bit creative with what you already have if you like if clothes are your thing and look at what you've got in your wardrobe and um, think how could I mix and, mix and match to make a bit of to make something that's got that same kind of vibe or what games do I already have um, is there a different way that I could play them that I haven't been playing them already um, that would essentially do what this other game is doing or could I give this game that I've got to my little cousin so he doesn't have to buy one and then I can buy a new game for myself if I really want it because my friends are all playing it yeah I used to go places and but yeah you know when you have that impulse to buy things sometimes it's quite addictive it's all there to like tempt us but um 
yeah I used to go and do exactly what you said and pause and think actually maybe I could make something like that and just just change the way you are out when you're shopping or when you're out around shops I mean and just be seeing it as like inspiration if you want to make something similar or do something it, rather than buying it and save yourself a lot of money that way as well yeah yeah coming from the money side it's sometimes it can be a good idea to have a little note on say if you're out in town or something to have a little note in your wallet or your purse that just says do I actually need to spend this or if you're buying online have a little sticky note on your um on your laptop or something that just says can my wallet actually afford this can the planet actually afford this yeah or make yourself wait a week and see if you still want it because or even mm -hmm. a day because oh, usually it's like an impulse thing rather than you really need it yeah um so another question that um i thought would be really interesting for you to answer um what's a simple solution that we can start with to reduce our impact through what we do buy mm. um yeah so sort of relating back to those two things that we can think about every day that we buy or use every day food and transport um i thought it's it's often sort of habits or what's like the norm around you that determines what you do so just taking those first steps to try something else rather than seeing it as a big deal that's hard to you know change just little experiments with trying alternatives can just open the door for you do you know what i mean um, so, and also if you've got other people around you that you, if, you know, if you're living at home and you want to influence your family and maybe you're not the person who does the cooking normally, you could learn some really interesting new recipes. There's loads and loads of stuff online, vegan recipes, vegetarian recipes, find some alternatives and use them to impress your family, inspire other people and introduce some new ideas. And similarly with transport, um, you know, you might be used to uh, being driven places it, and it is easier if you're in a city, for example, to use public transport than it might be in a more rural place. But you can, you know, with with resources now online like Google Maps or whatever, you can look up any route and find different ways of getting there that don't rely on a car. And it's made much easier now than it used to be. You don't have to look up, you know, loads of different timetables. You can just go on Google Maps and it's free and find another way of getting to where you need to get to or car share. And yeah, another good thing, um, especially, if, you know, teenagers going into maybe going to university or that kind of age when you might be getting a bank account. Um, just consider who you go with, because although you know, it's not use, it's not a spending thing, but they hold everyone's money. And, you know, the more customers they have, the more money they've got to lend. And some of them are investing in really damaging things. And some of them are actively not doing that. So it'd be much better to go with like a building society um, than one of the big high street banks, which are really, you know, there's lots of reports about the terrible things that they invest in from weapons to um, deforestation, all sorts of things that you probably wouldn't want to be supporting. Yeah. So yeah, food, transport and bank accounts. Yeah, it's definitely some, there's a lot to think about when it comes to things like this. So I think it's a really good idea to at least start with something that you maybe already know a bit about or you're already interested in and go from there, mm. as opposed to trying to jump in and trying to do everything at once or just looking at it and going this is way too much of a big problem for me to do anything about um it's all just about taking it at your own pace and starting from where you already have knowledge and what you're already interested in um I know I definitely probably didn't go about choosing my bank in the best way it has gone quite well for me so far but I really probably should have looked into it a bit more than what I did um so we, we had another question, which is, um, I personally have my own thoughts on this and my own experiences, uh, but how can we as young people communicate the issues um, around like climate change and our own carbon footprints and things like that with our family and friends to raise awareness of these issues, um, particularly surrounding consumption of goods and services um, and potentially changing people's minds? Um, it can be quite a difficult topic, I know. Mm yeah um so yeah i mean a lot of us avoid 
having those conversations with people because they can be challenging people can get defensive if they think that you're judging them or that you think you know you're doing something better and yeah it's a difficult conversation to have so I've I've sort of I'm not I haven't that's not really how I've done it in my life I've sort of done I've tried to just do what I think is right for me and then you sort of show by example and people can see things being done maybe in a different way than what they thought or um you know um, yeah it's different for different people some people like to try and persuade other people and if you're good at that then that's great um but you can you can just you can influence people in other ways either by just how you do things yourself or what you get involved in what messages you're putting out there like maybe you could maybe you can include it in um any other work that you're doing um writing that you have to do or writing letters to different publications there's lots of different ways to influence people um but i would i would say if you're like me and you don't like conflict with people and you feel like it's hard to bring these topics up it's actually probably not as hard it's not it's not always as hard as you think it's going to be like maybe we don't need to be so self-conscious about having a different view on things maybe people would find it interesting to hear an alternative perspective and you can just raise it as a question um and see if people see what other people think about these things you don't have to be saying i know what's right and i'm telling you what's right it's, you can just raise it as a topic and just see what where people are yeah they sound like some really good ideas i know it, it was really difficult when i first started doing things like this um, even years before I did, um, I've only started probably campaigning since February, but I've been interested in this stuff for um, years now. And I think um, what actually started to not necessarily change my uh, family's mind about um, things to do with um, consumption and how it affects the climate and environment, um, it was just through my own actions I started doing the things I started making sure that things were recycled um at first it was very much like if something was put in the wrong place I would make sure it was put back in the right place and um, for example like if something was put in the pile to be recycled that I knew wasn't recyclable I would put it in the right one um and just really simple things like that turning off the lights I know it's a massive cliche turning off the lights stuff like that but it really does um work because what you do starts to rub off on the people around you especially if it's like a family because you literally live with them and they start to adopt your habits um and then again just as Ruth said like instead of bringing it up as something that could that could potentially become a conflict um just bring it up as what do you think about this and then maybe if you think oh if my my ideas are very much um different to this maybe don't say your ideas directly just kind of giving the person the space to say their thoughts and then reflect on their thoughts after they've been said slowly by speaking um it can really start to get that ball rolling in their head um i know that's definitely what happened with me and my mom again um this is just speaking from personal experience obviously um i think the easiest people to start with are those not necessarily that you are closest with like your parents your siblings um but maybe people who you just think are going to be more on your kind of wavelengths with stuff like this and then start moving yourself out to people who might not be quite as closely related to this kind of stuff and uh, might have slightly different opinions from their own upbringing backgrounds previous knowledge and um, their jobs anything like that um another really good way like if you are genuinely trying to persuade people to change it maybe instead of saying oh but it helps the climate because a lot of people will think yeah but it's just the climate or something it doesn't doesn't it doesn't necessarily directly impact impact them now it will do in the future but it doesn't right now or they can't see how it is doing say other things like it's so much faster it saves you so much money because a lot of the time things like this do it might be a little bit more expensive just in the short term like you might have to buy something um maybe five pounds more than something else would cost but then you don't have to buy it for another 10 years 
for example, like a really good pair of shoes, you only have to buy them once. But then if you buy the cheap shoes, you got to buy them every six months because they just die. Um, yeah, I think things like that work really well. Do you have any other ideas? Yeah, mm, I was just thinking about things um, like sharing links if you found something really interesting, mm. um, simple things like that, or watching certain things that like documentaries or films are on these kind of issues. There's some really good ones out there and videos can really, I feel like that's a really good way for people to, to absorb information. It can really like change how people feel because they're quite immersive and you know the with the soundtrack and everything i think a lot of people change their minds from watching films and stuff like that so yeah you know like the plastics in the sea all the, all the david attenborough stuff that was really mm -hmm. really popular so it's not it's not um yeah it's not something that people haven't heard of nowadays and more there's more and more resources out there that um you can share to inspire people with yeah I think especially things like um documentaries like they kind of they kind of cater to everybody like adults love them kids often like them especially when they've got really good cinematics uh they can just be so good to watch and it's like you kind of take in the information almost without realizing it sometimes mm. um another thing I just wanted to come back to this what you said earlier um you were saying something about um trying out trying to teach yourself to cook um, maybe learning to cook more environmentally friendly meals. I just kind of want to give a little shout out to a YouTube channel, which is really good for this. I know quite a lot of young people will be on YouTube. Mina Rome, so many cheap, really quick to make, student friendly, more environmentally friendly meals. If you need that, Mina Rome, go for it. <laughs> how, do, how do you spell that? Would... M-I-N-A space R-O-M-E. Okay. I can probably link it in the chat. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Izzy, please, please do that, because I'm sure a lot of people will want to, to check that out. Um, now, uh, thank you both for, for what you just said. Some really important messages there and some really interesting things that both of you have, uh, have mentioned. Um, I want to pick up first on something that, Izzy, you have just said, which is about starting conversations with people. Because yeah, in the role that I do, one of the big things that I do is start conversations with people. And I've found that not everybody always agrees with me, but it's great to just start having that conversation because it does make people think. And while they might not do the big thing that you want them to do, they might take a series of smaller actions that are easier for them to do to begin with that then compound and build into a much bigger long term benefit. So one of the big things that I would take from what's just been said is start that conversation it's really important to in cop 26 and people at david attenborough give you a great opportunity to be able to start those conversations now i want to ask you two questions one which has come in from um from the audience and one that is uh coming from from me um let's talk about christmas so christmas is the biggest time for consumption of the year, not just eating and consuming things ourselves, but gift giving and wrapping paper and all of those sorts of things as well. So both of you, what would be the, the very quick hints, tips, ideas, thoughts that you have around how we become conscious consumers and ethical consumers in the Christmas period? If I start with, start with easy. <laughs> um. I think a really important thing is actually thinking what do my friends and family genuinely want so that you know that you're getting them something that they will treasure and they'll cherish um, and they'll take care of it and actually use it as opposed to something which it might look really nice and you think oh that's just that would go with their vibe so well but it's just going to end up um, sitting on their desk or it's just going to end up um, in their wardrobe or something and it might it might, um, yeah, it might fit with their room, but it might not be something that they'll look at and think, I'm really glad that X person got that for me. Or it might not be a pair of shoes that they wear every single day or something like that. And if you're not sure what to get them, don't be afraid to just give them money if you can afford it, because then they can buy something that they know they'll like, or maybe give them money and say, spend this on something 
that you really, really want or something like that. Um, another idea is rather than giving physical gifts, give like experiences. So maybe like say, oh, instead of instead of getting each other Christmas presents this year, let's all put some money in and we can go and do this activity that we really want to. Or we yeah, something like that. Um, Ruth? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing about experiences. Just it's like, for um, for example, my dad asked me what I wanted for my birthday. I know it's not Christmas, but I said, can you draw me a picture? And that was one of the best presents I'd ever had. Like, that was really, really nice. Um, but also doing things with people. And it doesn't even need to be something that costs money. It could just be let's meet up and go for a walk like you don't yeah there's loads of alternatives and we've got i'll put a link in the chat um we've got on the ethical consumer website if lots and lots of different articles about different types of ethical christmas so avoiding plastic or vegan christmas ideas or avoiding palm oil or avoiding amazon there's also you know christmas and it's not just Christmas, but from now, like this Friday is going to be Black Friday and loads of companies are really, you know, pushing stuff out and putting, so, you know, they're telling you it's a bargain and it's a sale, but actually things aren't necessarily cheaper at that time. It's just a gimmick, really. It's it's a way of manipulating us to spend more money. And yeah, we don't need to do that. We can have a good time without lining the pockets of these very, uh, you know, wealthy corporations. <laughs> Thank you for that. Some some really good ideas. Now, the other question that I wanted to ask you, and again, this is this is important to me and the role that I do at Working Borough Council, because I also am the person responsible for communications. Um, so all of the messages that come out of Working Borough Council come effectively through me and the, the team that I work with. And one of the questions that we've had is how can we advertise being an ethical consumer to our community and locally? Um, and I would add to that, how can we advertise becoming an ethical consumer to our residents locally? Um, and Ruth, if I could start with you on that one, please. So how can the council promote ethical consumer, ethical consumption? Yes, so yeah. how, how can the council do it, but also how can individuals within the community flag the fact that they are? OK, so I think a really useful thing, one of the things that holds people back is, first of all, not knowing that there's alternatives out there and then not being able to access them or, you know, the convenience of accessing them or finding out about them. So if you've got if you can somehow map what you have in your area, you know, if you've got a zero waste shop or, you know, if there's where there's places that particular types of things can be recycled or um if where the building societies are rather than the banks or any kind of options for more ethical choices if you can map that visually i think that would be really helpful to people and um can you say again the second part of the question about how people can say that they are doing these things or something just give me one second while i get the question how can we advertise being an ethical consumer to our community mm. and locally Mm. Oh, OK. Yeah. So individuals within their local area, I guess similar, like making these things more visible. So not everyone knows where things are. People often just go particular routes that they always go and they might not see things that are just on the next street. So just, yeah, making the options visible and doing, I guess, activities around them, like things like clothes swaps or repair cafes, these, these are springing up all over the country and they're really good community events and ways to, you know, yeah, fix stuff that you've already got or, um, yeah, um, yeah, share, you know, share the resources that we've already got. A lot of us have got more than we need and we can share it around. We don't need to be spending lots of money. Wonderful. Now, we need to move on to the next session. Um, so with that, I would like to say a huge thank you to Izzy and to Ruth for giving up your time tonight to come along and talk to us, to share your thoughts, your ideas, your experiences and some really wonderful insights that people can take away and start implementing themselves. So thank you both very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, now, you. the final session, the final session tonight, um, I'm going to hand over to Charlene Duncan um, and Charlene works with the Southeast River Trust. 
um, and she's going to be talking to us about the impact of climate change locally in Wokingham and some of the solutions that have been put in place. So thank you, Charlene. Also, don't forget, you can ask questions of Charlene in the chat um, and I will put them to her in about 20 minutes time. Thank you very much. OK, so hello and thank you. Um, I'm going to share a presentation now so you can see. Just bear with me. Um, hopefully that has come up. Um, so yes, as you said, my name is Charlene and I work for the South East Rivers Trust. Um, have I unmuted myself? Let me just double check. Sorry. Um, yes, yes, you have. OK, sorry. I just realized. OK, so yeah, I'm Charlene and I work for the South East Rivers Trust. So whenever I think of climate change, I think of it in relation to um, water and our water systems. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, how climate change might impact our water systems. And really, it can impact our water systems. So we've got um, too much water can result in floods. And if we have not enough water, which can result from climate change, it can mean that we can experience water shortages. So both of these things are things that can cause a real threat here in the um, And before I carry on and, and, and continue with my presentation, I just want to pause for a moment to, for you to reflect on which of these you think is a greater threat in the UK. So do you think water shortages um, or floods? But I don't want you to just guess. I want you to think, do you have reasoning behind it? Is there something that's led you to believe that water shortages or floods would be a greater risk. So have some reasoning behind it. So I'll give you a moment to think about that. Because essentially in this presentation, I want to give you the evidence. So whether I change your mind as to which you think is a greater threat, so maybe I'll change your mind, or whether I reinforce what you already thought, I want to arm you so that you're able to go away and you have good reasoning behind maybe some of your behavioral changes. And also that way you can reason with others and you can spread the message as well. So that's the aim of this presentation, to arm you with those sorts of details. Um, and um, so first I want, before I move on, I want us to just think about our weather systems, what kind of weather we have in the UK here. So if you ask anyone, usually they will complain about the weather, usually they will complain about the rain. And um, if you ask anyone who maybe lives abroad about what they think of the weather in, the, in England, they'll say, oh, it's always rainy there, it's horrible. So there must be an excess of rain here in the UK, surely. Um, and if you speak to people about climate change, there are people out there still who think that climate change will mean that we will get weather like this. So instead of these rainy, cold days, suddenly we will have this climate that's like Spain, where we'll have sunny summer days. And so climate change might actually be a good thing for our weather systems. But that's not how climate change works. I'm sure most of you already know. That's not how climate change works. It actually means will result in more extreme weather events. So like the ones that I mentioned. So that would mean either flu or droughts. These are two of the extreme weather events that could be that could occur here in the UK. So yeah, those are the impacts that it could have on our water systems. But what do I mean by water systems? So if we look at this map, the star is essentially where Wokingham is. And the Green River, there's a Green River there that's marked. Um, that is the Embrook. That is the local river that runs through Wokingham. And so that's your local river, but it's part of a wider network of rivers. And this wider network of rivers is called the Loddon Catchment. So the main um, river that runs through this area is the River Loddon, and it has lots of smaller rivers running into it. And the purpose of a river system is to drain the excess water from the landscape. That's the reason for them. And so rivers form at the low point in the landscape, and then they travel downstream. So all the rainwater that falls on the ground um, will gradually make its way towards the rivers, will drain and make its way toward the rivers, and then travel downstream. And in this case, the River Loddon goes, would go downstream and empty out into the River Thames. So that's the river system that I was talking about. And as you can see, it's a huge area area in orange, all is interconnected within this Loddon catchment and all drains into the local rivers. It's a huge network of interconnectedness. And um, talk about, so if we have floods, I'm going to talk about the impact of both floods and water shortages on the environment, on these water systems, and also the impact that that can have on people, on us. So let's start with floods. So floods, what sort of impact can floods have on the natural environment? So if we look here, here's some images of a very natural river and how rivers um, naturally cope with rain. 
So in a normal rainfall event, the rain would fall and it would land on the ground and 90% of that rain would infiltrate or would soak into the ground and then it would be stored in the ground so that the plants can use it, the trees and the, the other sorts of plants, it will be stored in the ground for days after that rain, the rainstorm um, and continue to water those plants. Um, and that's generally what happens in, in a normal rainfall event, but um, the types of rainfall events that we're now experiencing, the more extreme rainfall events where huge amounts of rainwater to were to land all at once, or maybe it's a really long period of heavy rain, then this it won't be able to infiltrate. The ground might become too saturated or it might fall too quickly, and then that would run off the landscape. So instead of soaking in, it would become runoff. It would rush towards the river because that's the low point. And, and then it could potentially River to overflow, to burst its banks. And so that's the advantage of the things that you see here. So the floodplain, if it were to burst its banks, that river water can then um, flow onto the floodplain and the trees and other plants, their roots, help that water to then soak into the ground, help the water to be infiltrated and for the landscape to retake that water. So it doesn't just go rushing off downstream, it's, it's captured in the landscape because remember that water is so useful for the wildlife and, and things that live there. So the floodplain is really important. The trees and other plants are really important for help capturing that rainwater in the landscape. And meanders are also really important. So those are the bends in the river that slow the flow. So instead of that water just rushing away downstream and maybe causing problems out where, out, elsewhere because it's all rushes downstream to a pinch point, or maybe rushing downstream and rushing out, down the river, river lot and out to sea, we want to capture that that's really useful in the landscape for all the wildlife that lives there. So all these things. Floodplains, trees, meanders are really important. Um, so what happens if, a, if you have a huge rainfall event, what can happen in the river? What impact will it have on the wildlife? Well, as I say, it might all rush and cause the, the river to become quite a torrent of water like you see here. And that could erode the riverbanks, first of all, and anything that might be nesting there would be disrupted. So kingfishers, water voles, ducks, they might be disturbed by this rush of water. If it, if it flows and bursts the banks and goes onto the floodplain, some of the water from the river it might take some of the animals onto the floodplain and they might get abandoned there as the waters retreat and so you might lose a few fish or you might use me lose a few invertebrates so it can have a huge rainfall event a flooding event impact a negative impact on the environment but in fact it can also have a positive impact impact in this sort of natural landscape so rivers have sort of silt that builds up in them. So it's some of the soil, some bits of soil and gravel and stuff build up over time. And those can smother the sort of vegetation that is growing on the riverbed or smother the gravel riverbed that makes a really good habitat for animals. Too much silt can be a real problem in rivers. And if you have a flooding event, it will grab all that silt and it'll wash the gravels, it'll wash off, off the plants that are in the river. And if it bursts its banks, the, the, the flood can deposit some of that silt on the floodplain and actually make that soil more fertile and, and make it better for the plants that are growing there. So yes, so floods can have a negative impact on the environment, but they can also have a positive impact when you have a natural landscape like this. And um, essentially, the key point is that it can recover, it's resilient. So yes, you might lose a few fish, a few invertebrates, but there are plenty of other fish and the populations will recover. Okay, but what about in an urban environment? So this is what's happened to a lot of our rivers or a lot of our urban areas. So we're paving over that landscape where the, the, the rain water can normally infiltrate. And so instead of it into the ground, 90% of that rain up to 90% is now becoming runoff. And it's landing on the paved surfaces or it's landing on the build up buildings and it's going straight to the drain. And if too much rainwater is rushing to the drain all at once, there's a risk of what we call surface water flooding and the drains could back up and it could cause flooding that way. But those drains also empty into the river. So the other risk is if too much water is entering the drains and flowing into the river, is again, the rivers could burst their banks. But you can see in the picture here that actually what we've done in cities and towns is we've built right up to the edge of the river. There's streets and houses there where if that river were to burst its banks, a huge amount of damage can, can occur. And so this is the sort of impact that floods can have for people. 
So it can damage houses out externally and indoors as well when drains back up. So pretty devastating to those homeowners, I think we'll agree. So that's a pretty horrific thing to have happened. Um, and what is the risk like in Daniel? Well, this is a flood risk map. This shows the risk of river flooding. So the dark blue areas show where the, the areas that are at high risk from the flooding and the light blue areas show the lower risk. And it might not look at, you can see it follows the path of the Embrook. And it might not look like that much, but essentially under those dark blue patches, there is an enormous number of buildings and streets and houses that could potentially be impacted from flooding. So, yes, there is a risk of flooding here in Wokingham from river flooding and also from surface water flooding. So that's the, when the drains back up. So you can imagine how many drains there are all across uh, all across the area. Um, and if those drains particularly low point, then that's where you're going to find the risk of flooding. And this is much less concentrated around the river and spread more um, evenly across Wokingham. And even in central Wokingham there, you can see some little dark blue patches that show there's a high risk. And so, again, those dark blue patches are covering a large number of buildings and houses that could potentially be um, at risk from flooding. So that's the risk of flooding here in Wokingham. But what about, what can we, so, so let's just sum up. So if we think about climate change, it causes these more extreme rainfall events, so heavy rain all at once, and humans are making the problem worse by building over the landscape so the rain can't soak in, and also by canalizing the rivers. That means putting them into this channel with these walls, building right up to the edge, straightening the channel so the water is just rushing downstream, where when it hits a, a pinch point, it could cause a huge flood. So all of these things, straightening the rivers, building right up to the edge and disconnecting the river from the floodplain and building over the natural landscape is really having a huge impact on the, that flood risk. It's massively increasing it. So what can we do to help? Green the landscape. That's the main thing. So, so many people are paving over their front gardens so they're turning it into a car park. We're losing our gardens. We're losing our green spaces. And if you think about schools, they have huge tarmac spaces. They have huge roof areas. And one of the things we're doing is what you can see here at this picture on the right, the plant that you see, is actually built within a school and it's built at the bottom of a downpipe. So the downpipe is the pipe that takes the rainwater from the roof and that it feeds it instead of going straight into the drain, it feeds that water into a planter and that planter captures the water. And so it relieves some of that pressure on the drainage network. And those sorts of uh, features that are capturing rainwater and so that it's relieving some of the pressure on the drainage network are called su sustainable drainage systems or SUDs. So look out for that. That's something that maybe you can consider campaigning to get it at your school. Or maybe there's things at home that you can do just to green your own garden and green the space around you. Because anything you can add to help capture that rainwater will reduce the pressure on the drainage network and reduce the risk of flooding. OK, so that's flooding. What about water shortages? So surely Wokingham is clearly at risk of flooding. There is a potential risk of flooding here. Um, so surely it can also be at risk of having water shortages because water flooding means an excess of water. But in fact, most of the UK is experiencing both because you have a short, sharp burst of really heavy rain and then followed by long periods of dry spells or else the rain that's happening overall throughout the year is actually less year in and year out. So despite these massive events, across the whole year, we are getting less rainfall than what we used to. And this is causing widespread water shortages. We're just kind of not noticing them yet because we have such a massive reserve that we keep tapping into. And so the impact doesn't seem as newsworthy as, you know, big headlines, this is happening, but it is happening even now. So let's talk about water shortages. What does it mean for the environment? So if we are, were to continue down this route and, and, and we're to extract too much water from the landscape, there's not enough water, so that's where we're going to feel it. The, water, the landscape's going to begin to dry out with all these water shortages. One of the first things to go is the trees because they use huge amounts of water. And so all the animals that rely on the trees, mature trees, need a lot of water to continue to stay alive. So and other plant life in the landscape. But also, if our rivers begin to dry out, this could have a devastating effect. So not just one or two fish that have been stranded on the floodplain, but whole populations of fish could be lost. And just the fish, but the entire 
food chain. So the invertebrates that feed on them or the, the that they feed on or the, the, the birds that feed on the fish, the entire food chain, the entire ecosystem is impacted. So if this river were to die out, all those things dry out, then all of those things would die. Huge populations and ecosystems would be impacted. And even if water were to return to the area, um, it would take a long time for those populations and for that ecosystem to recover. So hugely devastating for the environment. But what about for us? So it may have come to your attention in the news already that we are having some water shortages because every now and then we get a hose pipe ban. And so if there's a particularly long spell of no rain, so a, a drought, then it might be in the news, stop watering your garden, which doesn't seem very devastating. Yes, we might lose some of our lovely green plants in the garden. But if we think, yes, that's what we're, that's what's coming up in the news already. But if we were to have severe water shortages, I mean, water is so incredibly important. We would li we would not have enough water to fulfill our basic needs. So drinking water, hygiene, washing, all of these things can be impacted by water shortages. If we don't have enough water for these basic needs, I think you can agree that that would be incredibly devastating. But water is not just used um, directly for us, but also for crops. And so a lack of water, so a water shortage could result in crop, crops failing and it could impact our food supply as well. So pretty extreme, pretty drastic impacts that this could potentially have. Um, and why can this happen? So if we look, this is how we get our water. So it's a fairly simplified uh, um, diagram. This just shows where does our water come from for, for all those washing needs and, and things like that. We're extracting it from the landscape. So whether that's directly from the river, we might be taking the water that we uh, use directly from the river or from underground stores like aquifers, but it's being extracted from the landscape for our use. And we are currently taking more from the landscape than what is being replenished. Even with these extreme rainfall events, um, there's more com coming out of the landscape than what's going in. And so we call that when the demand exceeds the amount of available water that there is available in the landscape, um, then that area that has is experiencing that, we call it water stress. And you can see this is what a map of the UK looks like when you're mapping out the areas that are experiencing water stress. So again, that means we're taking more out, the demand exceeds the amount of water that is available for use. And so basically our usage is unsustainable. We're taking out more than what's going back in. And slowly, 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 the, the water levels in our rivers are getting lower and lower. Our aquifers, our underground storms are gradually emptying out. And because it's happening gradually, it's not making headline news. But you can see it's quite dramatic, this map. Um, and this is quite different from a map that I saw, the similar map only four years ago that had a lot more yellow on it. So the yellow areas are where the water stress is not as serious. And the red areas are the areas where it is serious. So you can see Wokenham is clearly within those red areas. So it is an area that has the flood risk and is at risk of water shortages as well. Both those things are happening here. Up water shortages again. Climate change is causing these extreme um, rainfall events, uh, these extreme events such as droughts. But it's also just less rainfall overall, and it's seven percent less on average across the UK. Is how much we're experiencing seven percent less water year on and year on. And um, we're making the problem worse. Humans are making the problem worse because we're increasing the amount of water we each of us use. So people are having more showers. These they did 40, 40 years ago. People are doing things like maybe rinsing off dishes before they put them in dishwashers. So just using it, using more and more water as if it's just never going to run out. And so not only is each individual person increasing the amount of water they're using, but there's more people. And those people are in places where there's already a high demand for water. So more houses are being built in towns and cities. There's already high demand for water in those areas. And that's what's making those areas water stressed. OK, so sounds pretty doom and gloom, but there are things we can do. So this is a resource that I actually made for a primary school. It has lots of little tips. I'm going to leave that up. Um, but there's lots of little tips of things that you can do to save water. I think the key thing to note is that 
each of us use approximately 150 litres of water per day. So if you can imagine a litre, big of water, we use 150 of those per day. And the key thing on this that I want to draw your attention to is the one at the bottom in the middle where it says letting a tap run for just 10 seconds uses one litre of water. Just 10 uses a whole litre. And so every time you turn that tap on and just let the water run down the drain without doing anything with it, it's being wasted. And so we need to just, I, I could tell you, turn off the tap while you're brushing your teeth. I could tell you, shower less, but actually you're intelligent. I'm sure you can come up with ways. If you just start thinking about every time you turn that tap on and you just let it run down the drain, you are wasting water and that's extracting a, one liter of water from the landscape. Um, if you can start just think, developing that mentality, I'm sure you can think of your own ways that you can save water as well. And if each of us could say, about a third, so we go from 150 liters a day to more like 100 liters a day, it would have a huge impact. Okay, so we've talked about lots of really great ideas as to how we can prevent climate change, which is incredibly important, like reducing our carbon footprint is so important um, because we do want to prevent climate change. But I guess my point here is climate change is here. It is causing floods. It is causing water shortages. It's happening now. And we also need to be thinking about how we're going to cope with these changes. So as they arise, what, how, what can we do to reduce the impact that climate change is going to have on the environment and that climate change is going to have for people? And I guess the key message is there is something we can do about both in an urban landscape to help reduce flood risk we can green the landscape. And, in a, uh, and to help reduce water shortages, we have the power to save water and that will make sure that we're using those water resources sustainably. And you know, the, this will, these two actions can drastically improve um, the impact, you know, drastically reduce that negative impact that could occur both on the environment and for people. So that's the message that I want you to take home. Hopefully now you are armed a little bit with a bit more with evidence on, on that question that I asked, asked, answered at the, asked at the start. And, and you can take this home and you take this message with you. Um, thank you for listening. Oh, wow, well, thank you for that, Charlene. I never knew that there was somebody that could get me to both fear flooding and droughts at the same time. <laughs> Um, but but you've achieved it. So um, so well done. A really, really fascinating um, presentation there. We've already had a couple of people um, ask if they can have copies of your slides and I'm, I'm sure we've already got them and we'll be able to to send them out. I particularly like the slide on um, on water usage and, and how we can we can save water. Um, and certainly this is a conversation that I've been having with my my council officers, particularly in the behaviour change area how do we make sure that we we waste um, less water we've got a couple of questions to ask you and then I'm, I'm going to wrap up we've only got a couple of minutes left so i'll ask you for some really punchy answers um so uh one question from the group is a few years ago i heard that if we didn't change anything that the uk would run out of water by 2025 is this true oh now that's a tricky one because obviously it keeps it's a shift in goalpost so, you know, it keeps, as the population increases, it keeps moving. I don't have, I, I just have to put my hands up and say, I don't, I, I don't know. Um, I would say if you want um, information on that, the Environment Agency website is the best place to go. Wonderful. Um, and also you talked about um, the sort of the risk of, of rivers drying out. Now, I know a lot of people uh, that are watching this will be you know, very, very avid lovers of, of animals, as, as am I. Um, do you fear that there are species in Britain that will die out as a result of potentially rivers drying out? And if so, you know, there, there are any that immediately come to mind? Yeah, so there are a couple of priority, what we call priority species. And so the ones that we're particularly concerned about, um, European eels. So you do have local e eels living in your local river system. And they come all the way from uh, an area called the, you know, the Bermuda Triangle just to get to your local river to live. And that's where the food is that they need. And if it dries out, we could lose those European eels, which is key. And trout, the brown trout as well. These are indicator species. They are, they, they, you know, they are indicators of a healthy um, river ecosystem. And the loss of those not only means it's sad because we would lose those, but it also means that our rivers are in a state that it's going to, it indicates that huge losses are going to follow. 
Okay, thank you for that. Um, I don't have any more questions on, on the chat at the moment, um, but if anybody does send any in, I'm sure all of our speakers today will be more than happy to try and answer them via email. Um, I will say thank you to you, um, Charlene. That's been absolutely fantastic. Really inspirational stuff. And you know, thank you to everything that the, the Southeast River Trust is doing right here in Wokingham. I know the Embrook has previously been straightened out for industrial use, and you are currently working to reverse that. And we're really grateful. Um, I really look forward to seeing the impact that that has on our community and on our environment. So thank you for everything that you're doing for us. And thank um, you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, with that, um, I'm going to start wrapping up. We've got a couple of minutes left. Now, you've heard from um, a panel today about actions that our community are taking in terms of energy, transport and ecology to help reduce our carbon footprint. You've also heard from them about the individual actions that you could potentially take to reduce your carbon footprint at home for you, your family and potentially for your school as well. We've heard about becoming an ethical consumer, what it means and what you can do to become one yourself and how you can encourage others to do it as well. We've heard about flooding and the potential impacts that that can have on us as a society and some of the actions that you can take and we can take as a community to help reduce the impact of that. And also we've heard about the risk of water shortages um, and the, the different factors and, and mitigations that you can put in place in order to be able to, to reduce that risk happening in the future um, and to, to cut the amount of water that you use. I'm hugely grateful to everybody for giving up their time to come and talk with us today. Um, you know, to to Duncan, to Georgina, to Domo, to uh, Izzy, to Ruth, and to um, Char uh, excuse me, to Charlene um, as well. Thank you, each and every one of you, for what you've done for us and what you continue to do for us as a community. Um, please, everybody, keep your ideas coming. I love hearing the ideas that you have, the things that you want us to be doing as a community um, and the things that you want us to be focusing on. Please share your ideas. There are plenty of forums in which you can do it so you can participate in the tree consultation that's going on uh, online at the moment. You can participate in the waste strategy. Um, we have uh, emails that you can sign up to on the council's website so you can hear more about our climate change agenda what we're doing and the different tasks that we're putting in place, the different actions that we're taking to reduce our carbon footprint and keep you up to date on our journey as a borough as we reach towards our net zero by 2030. Um, I know that the Youth Council really wants to hear your thoughts and your ideas as well. Please get involved in Anika's subcommittee in terms of climate change. Feed your ideas in through her, feed your ideas into the council. We really, really want to, to action them. Um, and for me, unless there's anything else that um, that Tabitha or Debbie need to say, I will say thank you all for giving up your, your afternoon, your evening for joining us for this, the second Youth Climate Conference. I hope you have found it interesting. I hope you've taken some really good actions from it. I really look forward to hearing about some of the, the actions that you've taken, the steps that you've put in place to reduce your carbon footprint. Thank you all for attending and I hope to see you again very soon. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>